my name is Scott Wise. I'm, I'm personally honored to have been asked by Elizabeth uh, to welcome you today and to make some introductions. First, allow me to uh, acknowledge the family, uh, Elizabeth, Malcolm's uh, wife and, and life partner of 53 years, uh, Stephen Gillis, Malcolm's son, and Nora Bynum and Heather, Heather Salter, uh, their daughters. Uh, also, their five grandchildren are here, uh, Jessica and Travis Streets, Elizabeth and Caroline Bynum, and their newest addition, uh, baby Sarah Salter, who was welcomed into the world, uh, I think, four months ago. And uh, uh, I'm told she has her grandfather's infectious smile, so uh, she's very lucky to have that. Um, and also many other family members uh, have traveled uh, to be with us today, and you'll have a chance, hopefully, <clears throat> to visit with them at the reception. Uh, so before I introduce um, our other speakers today, allow me to, to briefly describe uh, my own window into the life of Malcolm Gillis. Uh, I'd been at Rice for 14 years when Malcolm arrived on campus about uh, 22 years ago. Uh, I was here at that time as the chief investment officer working on the endowment. And um, even though we didn't really choose each other, we developed uh, a very strong bond uh, built on trust, built on respect, things, things that are important to all of us, and particularly important to Malcolm, uh, grounded in a, a love for, for Rice, uh, which he had really when he first arrived and had uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, we, we shared an interest in uh, financial markets. We shared an interest in all kinds of athletics and would, would talk uh, a lot about sports and athletics in general. Um, we, shared a, we had a common awe for the, the greatest hitter that ever lived, uh, Ted Williams. Um, as recently as two months ago, uh, Malcolm called me pretty much out of the blue to want to talk about the stock market. He would kind of do this unannounced from time to time and I wanted to know where I thought oil prices were going. And, um, and with Malcolm, uh, as you know, Malcolm had held strong opinions, so it was hard to kind of get a few words in uh, of my own opinion. So I was mostly listening to Malcolm's opinion about stock market and, uh, and oil prices. But he also kind of connecting it with, with, with the, the Rice connection, he said, well, and, and tell me about Rice's interest in, in the Haynesville and uh, about Louisiana and, you know, does Rice still have an interest there? And I reminded him that I'd left Rice five years ago. And he said, that doesn't matter. You can still find out. I, I need to know. I need to know. So, you know, his, 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 his interest and in, in, in love for Rice and, and really the active mind that Malcolm had w was always there. And, and that sort of active mind combined with his, his love for Rice kind of set him apart really <clears throat> from all others, I think. Well, in addition to hearing from uh, Heather and Nora and the grandchildren in a bit, we, we're, uh, we have five speakers today. Um, we have two colleagues and friends of Malcolm's uh, from Duke. Uh, as they described it earlier, they're still hanging out at Duke. Um, I think it's more than that, but that's how they self-described it. That's uh, uh, Dick White, who's University Distinguished Service uh, Professor Emeritus, Joel Fleischman, who's Professor of Law and Public Policy, and three speakers from Rice, uh, Gene Levy, who's the former provost, Bucky Allshaus, who's a longtime trustee, and by long time, that's more than a quarter of a century, so that qualifies as long time, and sort of the, the resident uh, uh, Will Rogers of uh, Rice University, I think. And, um, and finally, David Lebrun, the uh, seventh president of Rice University. So we'll begin with uh, Dick White. Well, I want to acknowledge with gratitude my opportunity to speak as a friend of uh, Malcolm's and on behalf of his many friends. It was an amazing opportunity to think back over 30 years plus of a friendship that became very important to me. And I tried to come up with adjectives or nouns that would sort of describe in my mind and for others uh, the man that Malcolm was. And indomitable came almost immediately. It's a big word for me. And I looked it up. And it means incapable of being subdued. And I'll tell you, if there's anybody who seemed incapable of being subdued, it was Malcolm Gillis. Another characteristic was loyal. Loyal to his family, loyal to his friends, loyal to the institutions he served at in sequence. And the third one was pragmatic. He solved problems. I've never seen it work out quite like this. He had a mantra that he's going to collect the information, get the data. He's going to ask questions, he's going to come up with some solutions, and then he's going to solve the problem. 
And throughout my thinking for these words, this kept coming back. This is the way he did it. And he did it with such superior success that the man was seen as successful in everything he did. He was a successful teacher. He was a successful researcher. It was unbelievable that he could come up with as many activities on his behalf as he, as he did. And I was involved with him over 30 years, and I'll give you some examples. And it was really amazing to watch. And even though he's younger than I was, he was a mentor in, in many ways. My first meeting with Malcolm uh, was, uh, I didn't know he was Malcolm. I was at a late meeting at a building up Duke campus, and it was getting late, and I was getting thirsty, and so I went out into the hallway to the water machine. And they had the old-fashioned handles and none of this fancy press stuff. And it was difficult to work. I got the water up, had my drink, and out of an office right next to me dashed this person. Can you hold the water? <laughs> and I, I said, sure. And I, he, I thought, well, you know, have a drink. No, no. Cupped his hands, filled his hand with water, and went splash. <laughs> Cupped his hands, filled his hands with water, and went splash. He said, that feels good. I don't need a drink. I'm making a deadline. He turned around and said, thanks, and went back into the building, into the room. I thought, well, that left me with two big impressions. This was a large man. <laughs> and two, he had great, large, colorful suspenders. And I, th I think the, the, the two takeaway messages there was, here's a guy who's going to be sort of iconoclastic in the academic world. I'm going to really like this guy. I didn't know it was Malcolm Gillis. Over the next five, six years, we got to know each other really well. We both got involved with the administration. And you, you know how he managed to solve problems. Uh, he became the dean of the graduate school, saw the difficulties that we were having there, looked into the problems, accumulated the facts, asked the questions, came up with a solution, and the graduate school after his tenure was far better than when he had gone into the graduate program in the first place. He did the same thing as dean of the faculty. This is a tricky position because I was one of them myself. And the faculty are a prickly group. Ma Malcolm had no problem with this. It was quite impressive. He found out that we needed this kind of help and that kind of help. He moved the faculty around. He saw weak departments and told them they were weak, and this was shocking. I don't think many of them had ever been told point blank that you're not up to what you're supposed to be up to, so get on with it. It was quite incredible. And so over those 30 years, uh, he really proved himself as an outstanding, not only researcher and teacher, but administrator. But his life was more than that. He, to use a hackneyed phrase, really did have interests outside the box. I'm a botanist. My specialty was tropical tree ferns. It's a very narrow specialty. There are a couple of us still interested in it. Malcolm said he was interested in plants. I said, oh, really? Well, you know, when you say you're a botanist, people expect you to come up and tell you how to grow your azaleas and fix your roses and this kind of thing. That was not my cup of tea. And Malcolm said he really did like plants. He mowed them with regularity. He, he loved mowing the lawn. He has a farm, and there are fields out there all the time. He also liked driving around on top of them with his tractor. And he had, he had projects all over the place. I've never seen a man who, when he wasn't busy at school, was busy with projects. And one of these, which was, I thought, pretty interesting, when we finally got to talk about horticulture, he came in in the fall of a year, maybe six years into our relationship, and he said, Dick, what, you're a botanist. What, what do botanists do when it's going into winter time? And I said, well, this time of the year, we plant bulbs. That sounds like a great idea. I don't have very many bulbs. How do you do it? I said, well, here it's difficult because under a quarter of an inch of soil, there's a rock ledge, and you plant bulbs with picks. I said, ah, this is going to be a problem. I'm going to love it. Elizabeth will love it when the Bulbs come up in the spring, it'll be fantastic. And he disappeared, and a couple of weeks later, he came back and he said, I had a great time. I've never seen a man with more energy and enthusiasm about everything he did. He had a great time planting daffodil bulbs. The spring came, he was ecstatic. Came over and told me several times how, although the plan didn't work out quite the way it was supposed to, I said, I tried to plant in some kind of a pattern uh, but I quit, can't because the bulbs don't go down. He said, I, I got around that. I just put bulbs in wherever they could go. And when the spring came, they were all over the place. And he thought it was just spectacular. And listening to him, I got all excited for him too. You know? 
another one of his favorite plants were morning glories. Well, I, morning glory, they're all right. <laughs> but he had read an article that morning and came in and said, you know, Dick, if you soak morning glory seeds, they're going to get, the germination rate will be greater, they're going to get ahead of the dry seed, and you're going to have flowers before you know it. Did you know that? And I said, well, I sort of had heard that people do that. <laughs> he said, well, let's have an experiment. He was big on this. I'll do it in my place, and you do it in your place, and we'll see if it's true. I said, fine. So he did. He went home, and he, he soaked his morning glory seeds. I went home and put mine in a petri dish and soaked them, too, and put them in the den. A week later, he came back. He said, Dick, what's happening? They're germinating. I can see the little root. I think it's a root. The little root. And I'm going to clean them up and put them in, and then I'm going to plant them, and then I'm going to plant right from the packet, and we'll see what happens. How did yours go? I'd completely forgotten about mine. <laughs> I went back and I said, I'll let you know tomorrow. And I went, they were moldy, they failed. I went back and I said, gee, Malcolm, you know, your experiment was really good and mine failed. He said, no, 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 no experiment ever fails. You had result, that's what experiments are all about. And bot botanists, professional botanists can make mistakes. I know lots of professional economists who make them all the time. So don't, so don't really feel too bad about it. Instead, go out and do it again. And so we did. We compared notes. We both came out with the same results. He was thrilled. They had a replication of two in the experiment and everything. It turned out well. He also had this uncanny ability to read people. And I mean that in a very positive way. With a little exposure to folks, he knew them really well. And he could sort of tell you about them mm -hmm. and tell them about themselves in case they had any delusions. <laughs> And he was really good at this. One example, in the summer times, he would love to go out and go salmon fishing, take the family, take friends. One time he even asked um, John Hope Franklin, his distinctive, distinctive, <laughs> distinct, a professor of distinction in, in, his, in history, in his mid to upper 80s. They went to Alaska. They came back with stories that are unbelievable. Malcolm said, these are fish stories, Dick, but they're true fish stories. And we sat and listened to it very motivated and very loud. And John Hope Franklin was a very quiet person. Then at the end of one of these times, because he told the stories pretty frequently, at the end of one of these times, he said, Dick, you know, I never invited you to go fishing in Alaska. You know, it's, the weather's variable. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. The insects are variable. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. It's cold, off and on, it's wet, you know, you don't swim very well. And I thought, I wouldn't ask you, because I don't think you would have enjoyed it. Now, looking at it, I apologize if I'm wrong. I said, Malcolm, you're right on. <laughs> I, I, I would really not have enjoyed the salmon trip, which was a little bit difficult. The other one was, uh, in the winter, Durham frequently gets these icy, snowy things. And Malcolm had no trouble with them, having all those years in the north with a truck that looks like a tank. He knew how to drive and was really very good at it. So it snowed and it rained and it hailed and the place got very treacherous and we'd let the staff all go home and I was getting trepidatious about leaving, so I was ready to go. And the telephone rang. It was Malcolm. Malcolm, I said, this is Malcolm here. I said, yes. No. He said, it's terrible out there. And you know these people down here don't know how to drive. They go to the right, they go to the left, they end up in ditches, they apply brakes when they're supposed not to. I'm going to drive you home. And I said, no, no, it's not necessary. You live 20 miles in a different direction. I, I'm sure I can do it. See you in the parking lot in five minutes. What can you do? I saw him in the parking lot five minutes, climbed into his tank, and we slowly made our way very safely home. Another characteristic of Malcolm, never waste time. And so there we are in the cab of the car discussing the plight of an apartment that we were struggling with together. He said, this is what I know about this issue, and this, what do you know about this? We shared issues. And he said, we've got to come to a decision. We've got to go in there and tell the department to shape up. And I think this is what we'll do. Came up with a plan. A week later, had a departmental meeting. He said, now, you know, the old farts aren't going to like this. And I, That's not nice to senior members of this department but the young Turks are going to revel in it. And because we're going to get arrows of outrage from these people, I'll do the lead introduction. And then you can just do what you want to do, but I'll take, you know, I'll take the brunt. 
I thought, well, what, how would anybody say no to that? So he did. He went into the department. We told them what they were going to do, that we had decided this in the cab of a car going home in a snowstorm. And it turns out over the next year and a half, accumulation of data, the asking of questions, coming to some decisions, and then doing it solved the problem. He was an amazing, amazing guy. The Wednesday before Malcolm died, I visited him. And the family gave me a few minutes uh, on my own, and we reminisced. Malcolm was there, and he had a few things to say. And then he talked about how this was a better day than yesterday. So maybe things will move along. I'm just going to do it one day at a time, Dick. He said, because I really would like to finish my book. And I really would like to go home, that is to Durham Farm, for Christmas and my birthday. But we don't know ahead of time what's what. So I'm not sure what's going to happen. But that's what I'd like to do. By the way, how is your book coming along? Well, he'd been asking that for the last five or six years. And I said, no, same rationalizations for why it wasn't coming the way it should. He just shook his head, didn't say anything. I said my goodbyes, which alas turned out to be farewells. I got to the door and he said, Richard, which is the first time in 32 years he ever called me by my full name. Richard, you should live life as I have lived life, day by day and to the full. And you've still got years ahead of you. And you know, every now and then you ought to step back and say, what is it you need to do and want to do? And by God, finish the book. And then he, he said, I am going to see you in December. Bye for now. He was an amazing man. Those of you who knew him knew that. It was fantastic loss. His legacy is incredible. Everything he did, he sort of did with triumphant joy. And when I thought of joy, I thought of David's ex ex exhortation in Psalms. Sort of to, you know, I thought about it then, plus make a joyful noise. Uh, it goes on in several ways. But make a joyful noise. And I thought to myself, Malcolm, every turn, made a joyful noise. And his friends are going to miss that noise and miss that joy. And I certainly will. Yes, Malcolm certainly was incapable of being subdued. Good afternoon, Elizabeth, and your children and grandchildren. Malcolm's many admirers and friends and colleagues. Uh, may the memories we have of Malcolm bring gladness to all our hearts. Just think of his radiant smile, his mischievous, twinkling eyes, and his whole, whole, whole body laugh. Who of us could ever forget the rock-solid, unwavering principles, passions, and determinations that underlay those always cheering, always infectious outward manifestations of the true goodness that Malcolm embodied? When the Bible describes the death of Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish people, and indeed of all three of the monotheistic religions, it writes, and Abraham was old. He had come through his days, and God had blessed Abraham in everything. One of the great commentators explains what the biblical phrase had come through the days means, and this is what he says. One who truly lives takes the crowning quality of each stage of life into the next stage. Literally, he comes through the days. He does not sink in his days, nor is he swallowed up by them. Rather, he passes through them. He retains all of the spiritual and moral attainments of his past and takes them with him into the future. He does not permit the days and years to rob him of anything that has become truly his. And that is how I always think of Malcolm. He did indeed come through the days of his life, building stage by stage on his personal and professional accomplishments in each prior stage, guided always by his unerring internal compass, yes, his doggedness too, and his down-to-earth practical values and anti-presumptuous style of speaking. There was absolutely nothing pretentious about him. He retained and practiced the praiseworthy values of his youth when he was raised by his grandmother, whose income, he wrote, 
was provided by Social Security, growing up in the midst of a community of people who lived hand to mouth without financial wealth, but rather with great riches of personal integrity, animated by the privilege of hard work and thankful for the blessing of mutual respect. Those values, a respect not for the material things that others have, but the kind of human beings that others are, determined everything that Malcolm did throughout his life of ever more distinguished achievements, both personally and professionally. Another great scholar um, wrote, Abraham's righteous man dwells in the midst of his city, in lively connection with his whole environment. He never ceases admonishing and teaching, objecting and warning, rectifying and saving as much as he is able. He is attentive to everyone and never tires of trying to right things, even if hope of success is slight. He never despairs of man and hastens to undertake any action for the sake of man. Like a gardener who lovingly tends a, tends a seedling, so does the righteous man perceive his task of writing and saving his fellow man. Consider how Malcolm's life mirrored that description. In his passion to improve the lot of Houston's less well-off residents, as well as the least well-off of many all over the world, Malcolm dedicated his life to righting social wrongs, creating ladders for the poor and otherwise discriminated against to climb out of poverty, in engaging with those of other faiths, colors, and ethnicities, and always being the best kind of genuine human being anyone could be, with the fire of social justice burning in his heart, with zeal to persuade others to do their just act, with a kind smile invariably on his face, and with fun in his heart. Malcolm was a Southerner born and bred. Born in Dothan, Alabama, he worked his way through Chipola Junior College in Florida, from which he earned his first degree, an associate in arts degree, after which he transferred to the University of Florida in Gainesville. He was a man who loved the South for the genuineness and down-to-earthness of its plain-speaking men and women of all colors, who enjoyed the camaraderie of the dirt farmers among whom he grew up, and when he settled at Duke, who chose to live not in the city of Durham or the town of Chapel Hill, where most faculty members live, but on a working farm in a rural community 20 miles north of Durham called Rougemont. I think he often thought of himself as being an actual farmer, whether looking after the farm animals or nurturing young students, the saplings of our universities. Moreover, in keeping with his former farmer identity, he drove a pickup truck instead of a car, and for his clothes, he often wore blue overalls instead of trousers and a jacket. Indeed, my colleague John Burness tells about his first meeting with Malcolm this way. John had been recruited from Cornell University, an Ivy League institution, to become Duke's Vice President for Public Affairs and Government Relations. Soon after coming to work at Duke, he was approached while walking across Duke's main campus by a person he didn't know who came up to him and said, are you the man who is heading our public and governmental relations? And adding, if so, I've been wanting to meet you. After noting the overalls and muddy, clunky shoes, John was not sure he wanted to meet him. <laughs> However, Malcolm's hearty personality and gregarious, gregariousness combined to overcome the unusual nature of his dress in John's mind, although as he told me the story of that first meeting, he recalls that his first, ma his first thought was that the interloper must have been a pig farmer straight out of after, after having slopped his hogs in the, in the pasture. John said that seeing that figure, he began to wonder what kind of a community he'd gotten himself into. He soon learned not to judge Malcolm by his clothes. As a university administrator at both Duke and Rice, he was the epitome of a leader who cared as much for the local folks outside the university as he did for his students, faculty, colleagues, and staff. When he was a dean of the graduate school at Duke, he hired the first full-time assistant with the responsibility of recruiting African-American students. His life was a never-ending series of engagements 
designed to bring about a greater measure of social justice for those whom society was forever leaving behind, whether because of inattentiveness or deliberate choice. And that was true not only in America, but around the world. He devoted his career to developing, helping developing world countries become more adept as well as successful in developing themselves economically with fiscally sound public policies. He was tremendously proud of the fact that he had trained the public finance civil servants of 20 nations in the field of public finance economics, several of whom became their nation's minister of finance. As Malcolm's Harvard colleague Dwight Perkins wrote, more importantly, his contra contributions to Indonesia contributed in a direct way to raising the standards of living of over 200 million people by a substantial amount, not only at that time, but today as well. His caring knew no geographical, racial, ethnic, or religious boundaries. At Duke and Rice, he was passionately committed to realizing equal opportunity for African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Asian Americans. As Dean of Duke's Graduate School and Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, he drove Duke's effort to diversify the faculty and student body. He launched a widely heralded and successful campaign called the Black on White Steering Committee, which convened conferences to develop strategies for increasing diversity at all levels. My colleague Dick White, whom you just heard, who was then Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, and gave the plenary address of the first conference of that effort. At Rice, Malcolm did exactly the same thing, creating the President's Council on Minority Affairs and the Office of Minority and Community Affairs. Moreover, Malcolm was passionate and thoroughly unapologetic about his passion for public higher education. At this time in which many states, including Texas and North Carolina, higher education is under assault as never before, Malcolm never tired of making the case for it. In a wonderful speech he gave in November 2002, entitled, Making a Life, Making a Living in 21st Century Texas, he had this to say about the reason he was so committed to public education. He said, the support for higher education in Texas has been deteriorating even more rapidly than in the nation as a whole. I make no claim to be a neutral observer. Rather, I am bound to state my own very sizable debt to public higher education. As a 17-year-old raised by a grandmother on Social Security, I would never have been able to step on even the first rung of the higher education ladder, but for the presence of a community college in walking distance from my home and place of work. The impetus conferred by this institution carried me to the state's land-grant school, Florida, and thence to another public university for Illinois for a PhD. Nothing I could ever do would cancel that debt, he wrote. And passionate, too, about the vital importance of high-quality education in developing the poorer nations of the world. It is impossible to overstate Malcolm's lifelong devotion to human resource development to improving education and to mitigating the effects of poverty on the world's less well-off people. He agreed to accept the chairmanship of the board of directors of the Vietnam Education Foundation. Few sitting university presidents would spend their time, energy, and fundraising connections in helping other universities, but Malcolm did. I noted that he was the only university president who served on the board of the Vietnam Education Foundation. He also did the same thing for the private University of Bremen, now called Jacobs University in Bremen. Not only did he sit on the board of the Vietnam Education Foundation, he designed the programs it administered to facilitate graduate degree fellowships, short-term postdoctorate visiting scholar grants, and U.S. faculty scholar grants to teach in Vietnam. He was a trustee also of Pyongyang University of Science and Technology in Pyongyang, North Korea and Tan Tao University in Vietnam. Moreover, he was not a do-nothing trustee like so many other nonprofit trustees. He personally approached American foundations to raise money for these universities. Malcolm was a proud Scotsman, as you know. In a speech he delivered to the Royal Society of Edinburgh on September 25, 2001, Malcolm led off by saying, quote, my mother's people hail from the Isle of Skye, my father's from the sky in the Black Isle, the cross of St. Andrew flies in our home, so it is a special privilege 
to speak one of, before one of Scotland's most notable gatherings. But Malcolm was as generous a human being in all ways as the Scots are reputed to be parsimonious. <laughs> when Malcolm passed away, he had just finished working on a new edition of his widely admired text on economic development. And when he learned that the publisher planned to charge $200 a copy, his legendary ire rose up within him, forcing him to cancel the contract with the publisher and instead made his book an open source, open source text for which the students would have to pay nothing. Surely that generosity would raise eyebrows among his Scottish ancestors. But of course, Malcolm wouldn't care a bit for those raised eyebrows. He always knew what the right thing was and he always did it. The extent to which Malcolm had the courage of his convictions was vividly brought home to me when Duke's then president, for no good reason, sought to sabotage an, in an initiative in which Malcolm strongly and rightly believed. He faced down the president and succeeded in activating other administrators as well as trustees to overcome the president's opposition and instead to support what he and virtually all others involved in the issue wanted to get done. That took real guts of which Malcolm had a plenty. Here's one, another instance of Malcolm's relentless spirit of the right outcome, especially when mindless bureaucracy threatens to get in the way. I saw Jean O'Barr, the founder of Duke's Women's, Women's Studies program last week, and I told her I was coming here to speak, and she said, you know, I've got a story I want to tell you. When Malcolm was dean of the graduate school, she said I, she had proposed a, the approval of the first graduate course in feminist theory. But when she submitted it for approval to the graduate faculty council, it was turned down. So she went straight to Malcolm and she said, Malcolm, would you approve if I registered all 19 graduate students who signed up for this course as independent study candidates under my direction? And Malcolm characteristically smiled mischievously with great satisfaction, said, Gene, that's a terrific idea. Of course I will approve that. As in those two cases, Malcolm was known by all for having strong views on many issues, a matter to which Dick, Dick White has already referred. Occasionally, however, he was known even to have changed his mind. Malcolm was a graduate of the University of Florida, which in 1989 asked him to consider being a candidate for its presidency. In his letter to the University of Florida trustees withdrawing his name from consideration, Malcolm wrote the following, quote, moreover, 27 years of marriage to another University of Florida graduate has heightened my appreciation of the richness of the opportunities facing her over the next several decades and of the sacrifices she has made for me and our children from the very beginning. Those opportunities are most evident here at Duke. Furthermore, I discovered in the research for this talk, I found in my files a press release that Malcolm personally sent to me on October 18, 1989. In this press release, he also wrote the following, quote, I am tied to Duke University by a network of friends and colleagues in the faculty, by hardworking staff, the administration, and the student body past and present, whose vision and commitment I have come to share. Notwithstanding the immense possibilities as well as challenges in the future of the University of Florida, listen to these words, I am inextricably tied to the future here at Duke. Alas for Malcolm's friends and colleagues at Duke, about three years later, he became untied. <laughs> and you here at Rice were the reason, and you benefited from that being untied. Many of us at Duke hoped mightily that when, when Duke's presidency opened up at the end of the 1992-1993 academic year, Malcolm would be, be chosen to succeed him. Malcolm was clearly the inside choice for that role, but Duke's search committee decided that Duke had had too many inside presidents and should go outside instead. Almost immediately thereafter, the powers that be at Rice recruited him, and Malcolm was forever quoted later as saying, being president of Rice was exactly what God intended for me to do. And from, the moment, and from the moment he arrived at Rice, he began earning the same respect among Rice employees from bottom to top that he had gained at Duke. 
On one occasion, Malcolm's Rice assistant, Jackie, relayed a story about Malcolm to my assistant that speaks volumes about how down to earth a human being he was. Here's what she shared. This is the quote. One of the part-time Rice faculty members who is also a priest wrote a little note to Malcolm recently, she said. He said that he was standing at the bus stop on campus along with several housekeeping employees. One of the housekeepers, a woman, asked the faculty member if he had met the new president. She went on to say how wonderful the new president is. She told the priest how Malcolm had gotten up from his desk, come out of his office to introduce himself to her, and then spoke to her fluently in Spanish. She was clearly impressed and was telling everybody so. Jackie told Pam they all loved him and knew how very sad we at Duke must have been to lose him. And of course, she was right. We all know that Malcolm's extraordinary achievements throughout his career must also be credited to his devoted wife and life partner, Elizabeth, the wonderful Elizabeth. And indeed, well before Malcolm's retirement in 2004, Rice created in 2000 a university-wide award, university award for exemplary service in Elizabeth's name. While at Harvard, Duke, and Rice, Malcolm was a prodigious scholar and a gifted, entertaining teacher, both a visionary and a skilled administrator in implementing his visions on the ground. He was a devoted husband, father, and grandfather who shared with the less well-off people of his communities and the world of, of all colors the same intensity of caring and love that he conferred on his wife and progeny. We are all better for having known him, though I'm sure he would have given us the whole, that whole body laugh had he heard us say it. In my research to fulfill the honor of speaking this afternoon, I read through the proceedings of Malcolm's installation as Rice President, and I discovered the following touching benediction on that auspicious occasion, written and delivered by Rabbi Shal Asadshi, who was the, at that point the president-elect of Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston, and now is the rabbi of a congregation in Calgary, Canada. It speaks so powerfully to the values that Malcolm lived by and that guided his years of leading and serving Rice that I will close my talk with it. Let us pray. Mekor Chaim, in Hebrew, source of life, we are mindful of your world and are our responsibility to it. Beyond the mighty oaks that encompass this university lie communities of people plagued by violence and pain and beset by hunger, poverty, disease, and despair. They seek the wisdom and knowledge to celebrate life and to rise above the daily struggles and hurdles. Mikor Chachma, source of wisdom, Bless this university with the resolve to exert itself as an influence for good that flows from this prestigious well of learning and understanding. Endow Malcolm Gillis, the newly installed president of Rice University, with the clarity of vision and strength of purpose to uplift this institution as an abode of academic excellence, as a sanctum of tolerance and respect for diversity, and as a beam of light that can penetrate the dark corners of societal injustice and inhumanity. May this university of leaders, he continued, administrators, faculty, and students continue to be leaders of change, wise and erudite visionaries of harmony and peace. El Hanun Rahvarachum, compassionate and merciful God, may the joy and celebration of this milestone occasion remain as a source of inspiration and dedication to pursue the higher ideals of this esteemed institution for many years to come. And he closed by saying, blessed are you in your coming and may you go forth in life with God's blessings. And it can be said with certainty, these are my words, and it can be said with certainty that God did bless Rice and Houston, as well as indeed the wider world through Malcolm Gillis's life and passionate leadership for the good. Amen. Thank you very much.
Some Enchanted Evening was my father's first request for the music for this service because that's what was playing the night that my father met my mother who has been the love of his life ever since then. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nora Bynum, oldest child of Malcolm and Elizabeth. By now you've surely guessed that my father loved music and poetry, but he also loved nature and being outdoors and especially all the creatures of the land, the sea, and the air, which he also taught us to love. The poem I will read was one of Dad's favorites, and he would recite it to me at bedtime in his deep and sonorous voice, caught up in the wonder of the cadence of the poem. And to you, Dad, I just want to say, of course, I love you, but I want to say thank you. Thank you for everything, but especially thank you for teaching us to love tigers. This poem of the same name was written by William Blake. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thy eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp, dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who make the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? For those of you who don't know me, my name is Heather Salter. I am the second of Malcolm and Elizabeth's three children. For all of his children, my father was a teacher, a protector, an example, and an inspiration. He was also funny and strong. And he demonstrated in everything he did that he was one of our biggest fans. He always took an interest in what we were doing, encouraged us, and was ready to give advice if we asked for it. He was the kind of father that many people only wish they could have had. So for the three of us, he was always, most importantly, the world's greatest dad. But at the same time, we were always aware of the work he did for his profession and for others. And we were so very proud of him for everything he did, not only for us, but for so many people around the world. For this reason, Nora, Stephen, and I treasure the words that our family friend, Bruce Lawrence, wrote to commemorate his death. Bruce is Professor Emeritus of Religion at Duke University and has been close to my dad and our family for many years. We love the vision that he has about what my father is up to now. We're proud to have had my dad as a father during his life, and we continue to be proud of him in his activities now. So here is what Bruce imagined for my father. Malcolm is one of those few people who is larger than life and even larger than the afterlife, at least as it is commonly conceived. It is stated in scripture in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, in my father's house are many mansions. While I have no doubt that Malcolm has gone to heaven, I cannot imagine him in a mansion, even a celestial built for eternity mansion. For Malcolm, God has prepared not a mansion, but a boat. I imagine it to be a boat with tackle and bait, numerous cabins, and now an itinerant cabin, a captain at the prow who sails and sails and sails on through all the galaxies. Jesus promised to make his disciples 
fishers of men. Malcolm was a fisher of men par excellence when he was among us. No one who knew him could avoid his scintillating intellect, his keen observation, his tireless imagination, as also, as also his gentle firmness. He snared all of us who were close to him. And though he also fished in the great waters of Alaska, it was those who saw him in North Carolina or Texas who came to know what a fearless and priceless angler of men and women was Malcolm Gillis. Now, I fear for the angels, for if Captain Malcolm is roaming the galaxies, as I imagine he will be charged and empowered to do, he will no longer be a fisher of fish or a fisher of men, but a fisher of angels. And all those creatures who have enjoyed eternity will also be challenged and renewed by Malcolm. For being caught by him is to discover the depths of your own being, aquatic, terrestrial, or celestial. Malcolm ascends, and we who knew him now must watch and wait for further reports on his tireless boating and his generous regaling of all who catch or were caught by him. May we, may we never cease to remember Malcolm the fisherman, a gift who has returned to the giver, leaving us all in joyful tears for his time among us and with us. Thank you very much. We love you, Dad. once upon a time provost at Rice University. I was touched and deeply honored when Elizabeth asked if I would be willing to speak uh, for a few minutes at this memorial service for Malcolm. But then I was struck dumb, or nearly struck dumb, by the quandary of facing at once the fact that there is so much to say at the same time that words are so inadequate. I didn't know where to begin, and I was mindful of the fact that I was going to be the fourth or fifth speaker, and that uh, probably most of the water in the fountain had already been drunk. Um, so late last week, I thought I might be saved uh, when Dean Curry said to me, let me tell you a funny Malcolm story. Dean is cringing. 
Dean and I both serve on a board uh, of a science NGO, and we were at a board meeting together in Washington last week. But then Dean added, but you cannot use it. <laughs> He's wiping his eyes in relief. So I thought to myself, of course I'll use it if I want to. But first, I've got to get Dean to tell it. So I said, sure, I won't use it. Tell me. Anyway, it's a good story. Uh, it's vintage Malcolm. It involves Alaska, fishing trips, bears. And in the bargain, I have to admit, it's a very funny story. Uh, but Dean was right. I cannot possibly tell it. <laughs> and it's a shame because it involves all these things, bears, Alaska, fishing trips, the kinds of things that Malcolm managed to drop into a conversation anywhere and on any topic at any time. But you're not going to hear it from me. Uh, I just wanted you to know that there's a funny Malcolm story hanging in the air here. You're just not going to hear it from me. I knew Malcolm uh, for 15 years. He hired me as Rice Provost in 2000. We worked closely together uh, in neighboring office suites connected by a private passageway on a daily basis for four years until Malcolm stepped down as Rice President in 2004. There are stories about that passageway, but I won't go into it. We remained good, warm friends and colleagues for the 11 years that followed. I want to say a few words about Malcolm as the president of Rice. And again, I want to say just a few words because a lot has already been said, and I don't want to repeat what has been said. I don't have time to talk about everything. Uh, but I know that Bucky All's house and David Lieberman speaking uh, a few minutes from now will touch on other aspects. In particular, I want to mention two aspects of Malcolm's approach to the university presidency. These are two among many that I found to be clear and uplifting markers of this man's intellectual and personal and emotional engagement and selfless, broad public spirit. The first is what I found to be, in fact, Malcolm's very high degree of engagement with the intellectual work of the university, with the intellectual work of the university's faculty and the students, as well as with advances in research that he read about in the published literature more broadly. These are the things, among the things, that truly motivated Malcolm. They're the things that motivate me, and that I resonated with them uh, enormously. It was more or less the norm that when Malcolm and I met to discuss one thing or another, a, f a very frequent occurrence in the years we worked together, that he would first jump to something he had seen in Science Magazine or in Nature. These are two of the broadest Science Magazines published. And, and he would want to talk about something that had recently been published in the literature before we got to the subject that we had met to talk about when we would discuss the potential appointment of a dean or a vice this or a vice that in the administration or the recruitment of a senior professor from outside, Malcolm was most excited when in his interview, the conversation had wandered into a particularly interesting book or article or line of research. That was always the first thing he wanted to talk about. Or I would sometimes get an email an email from Malcolm asking if I had in my interview talked with the candidate about a particular book or line of research or how impressed he, and how impressed he had been with it. Malcolm's genuine intellectual engagement was one of the pleasures of working with him and more importantly, one of the foundational attitudes and marks of effectiveness that he brought to his work as a university leader. I know that students and faculty members across the university have experienced this aspect of Malcolm both during and after his term as president. The other aspect that I want to touch on briefly before I conclude was Malcolm's broad sense of public spirit and educational evangelism. Some has been touched on before. 
Malcolm was heavily engaged in working to establish three universities uh, around the globe during and after his term as president. It is known by many on this campus that Malcolm was instrumental in helping to found uh, and starting 17 years ago serving as a board member of what is now known as Jakobs University in Bremen, Germany. He was also one of the motive forces in propelling the establishment of Pyongyang University of Science and Technology in North Korea, a particularly difficult environment to work in in this kind of endeavor. And finally, Malcolm was a guiding hand in the establishment and definition of Tantau University in Vietnam. I had the long pleasure of serving with Malcolm uh, as a member uh, uh, of the Tantau University board, the two of us helping to guide the startup and the progress of that university. Uh, Malcolm was the, was the chair of the board of trustees. I was a member of the board of trustees along with him the whole time. Tantau University, or TTU, is in many aspects modeled after Rice University at the direction of its founding benefactor, Madame Huang Yen Tidang. Just two weeks ago, TTU graduated its first class at a commencement on the campus in Long An Province, 30 kilometers west of Ho Chi Minh City, of downtown Saigon. Until a few months before his death, Malcolm and Elizabeth were planning to attend that commencement, as were Erzabeth and I. Tragically, Erzabeth and I had to attend without our dear friends. I can tell you that Malcolm's absence, to say nothing of his death, were acutely felt at the ceremony and remarked on to us by many students, faculty members, and leaders of the university uh, with great sadness. Also, in sync with the TTU commencement, the first TTU building, uh, the university's impressive equivalent of Lovett Hall at Rice, was unveiled as Gillis Hall, uh, something that uh, we felt was touching and fitting a monument to Malcolm's selfless contributions and public spirit as manifested in Tantau University, among many other manifestations that you've already heard about this morning and some you probably haven't heard about. I want to end by saying that Erzabeth and I cherish our long professional relationships and friendships with Malcolm and Elizabeth. Malcolm is missed by many people and acutely by both Erzabeth and me. I want to thank Elizabeth for asking me to speak here this morning. Thank you very much. I had the privilege of being on the search committee to determine who the sixth president of Rice University would be. It was a committee of about 20 or 12 people. And if you've ever been on a committee like that, you realize that you get a lot of suggestions and a lot of advice about what type of president the university needs at that time, whether it's male or female or science or humanities. We got names from all over the country. Students would give us suggestions. Faculty members would give us suggestions. Even Fred Goldsmith, the head football coach, came to me one day with a wad of piece of paper and he said, some guy called and told me, this is the guy you need to get. <laughs> Truthfully, I put it in my pocket and never took it out again, but he gave me a suggestion. The name that came up over and over again in our search was Malcolm Gillis. And Charles Duncan and I had the pleasure of flying to Washington, D.C. to interview him for the first time. And we were aware of his academic background that you've heard about today, his leadership ability, his intellectual ability. But we wanted to know the man. We wanted to know what he thought he could do for Rice University. I'll never forget going in the first meeting room with him, shaking that firm handshake of his, having him look you straight in the eye, and he was all empowering and bigger in life. But at the same time, he was warm and welcoming. Charles and I sat and exchanged pleasantries with him and talked about families. And then we got down to business and Charles and I started to ask him about what he knew about Rice University. I know this will surprise you, but Charles and I lost control of that interview very early on. <laughs> After about two or three questions, uh, Malcolm kind of stopped and said, look, let me, I, I understand that, but let me ask you this question about this policy. Let me ask you about this department. Let me about, ask you about this issue. 
Charles and I both admitted afterwards that not only did we not know the answers to those questions, sometimes we didn't even know there were issues. <laughs> but as you know, if you've ever talked to Malcolm, the good thing about him is when he asks you a question, you don't have to wait long before he'll give you the answer. <laughs> and so Malcolm told us uh, what he wanted to do with Rice University and to solve the problems. And Charles and I were impressed and liked him immensely. And I drove him to the airport after the interview we talked a little bit about Elizabeth and his family, and he was so excited because he had recently celebrated a birthday, and I think Elizabeth gave him an autographed picture or a baseball of Ted Williams. He loved those Red Sox, and he loved Ted Williams. He got a chance to come and speak to the committee, and of course the committee fell in love with Malcolm, and we made the decision that he would be the next president of Rice University, a decision none of us have ever regretted. And the thing about Malcolm uh, was, is what you see is what you got, and we all appreciated that. We had the press announcement uh, here at Rice, press conference. Fred Goldsmith, the head football coach, was there and came up and said, I want to thank you for making me so, look so good. My fraternity brother from Florida said, you got the right guy. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, the name on the piece of paper, it was Malcolm Gillis. <laughs> David, we asked uh, Ken Hatfield, the coach at the time, about, you know, could, could a lawyer really be a president of a university? We, we got you, so. But Malcolm came to Rice, and uh, the thing about Malcolm, as you know, he did not sit still, and he wanted to move forward, and he wanted to enhance his university. And the first thing he did is he started to look at what the issues were, and he started to discover what the needs were of the university, and they took steps to fulfill those needs. He convinced the Board of Trustees that we needed to have a comprehensive capital campaign, the first one in the history of Rice University for $500 million. And you can still see the effects of the campaign on campus with Martell College, a college that was started while he was uh, here, Humanities Building, and of course one of my favorites, uh, Reckling Park, the baseball field which my belief was is if we hadn't had that park, we would have never won our first national championship. Malcolm also renovated old buildings that were in deeply needed of repair. He established stronger and better relationships with the Texas Med Center. He even served on a committee at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, the Donkey Committee. <laughs> and yes, he asked to serve on that committee, <laughs> only as Malcolm would. But the thing that impressed me with Malcolm Gillis was some things that have already been addressed. And that is not the buildings, it's not the departments, it's not the issues he resolved at Rice University. It was the way he treated people. Malcolm loved people. I don't care whether you were the chairman of the board of Coca-Cola or whether you worked uh, in the commons of the servery or cleaned up the stadium after a football game. He treated everyone the same, with respect and dignity and honor. He always had time for him. He was always there for him. None of us in this room, perhaps Elizabeth, will know how many lives he has touched by his kindness and by the assistance and help that he has given people. I recall once after a graduation ceremony, I noticed there was a former athlete graduating who had played ball here eight or nine years earlier, a very successful athlete. And I was curious as to why he was walking through the procession at that time. And I saw him afterwards and I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing here? You have more money than you need. You're a successful person right now in your own right. And he said, I'm here because I'm getting Malcolm Gillis off my back. He said, Malcolm has called me and written me two or three times a year and said, you need to come back and finish your degree and diploma. And that's what he did. And I asked Malcolm about it, and he mentioned about eight or nine other people that he did the same thing for. We'll never know how many lives he's touched as a result of his leadership and his academic teaching at Harvard, at Duke, for setting up the universities around the world. 
But I loved Malcolm Gillis, and I loved him for a different reason. I can recall the last time I saw Malcolm. He was at MD Anderson, probably fitting Charles and Duncan, and I went over there to see him. He was not the large, bigger-than-life person that we met the first time in Washington, D.C. He was frail. He knew what was going on. We talked about the good days we had at football games at Charles Nan's Ranch and Cody. We talked about friends, Jack Trotter, Evans Atwell, Johnny Lee Cox, the things we used to do together, talk about, have fun. And Charles was talking to him about an issue, and I was looking at Malcolm, and I thought to myself, is this the last memory I'm going to have of Malcolm lying there, frail? That's not what I wanted to remember. And just at that moment, Elizabeth walked in with Sarah, the new grandbaby of probably three months. And she brought him in and said, Malcolm, uh, look who I have to see you. And Malcolm's eyes had the sparkle and light in them. The smile on his face was whiter than the sunshine. And you could feel the warmth and love that Malcolm had. The love that he had not only for the new grandchild, but for Elizabeth and his family. And throughout my relationship with him, it was a long time, that was the thing that his life was about, was family. I will miss him. Hello. I am Jessica Streets. I'm the oldest granddaughter. And Malcolm Gillis, who we all call Poppy, is my grandfather. I have been so incredibly lucky to grow up knowing him. From dreamy childhood days with he and my grandmother and various assorted goats, dogs, cats, geese, and cows on the farm in Bahama, to rides to the dump in the old blue pickup truck, to getting to share in the experience at this great university. I graduated in 2009, Martell College. But perhaps my most treasured memories of my grandfather are our shared affinity for flight. When I expressed my desire at a young age to follow in my hero Amelia Earhart's footsteps and learn to fly, much to my mother's chagrin, <laughs> he not only supported and encouraged me, he often came along. That is who he was. He taught us to dream, and he helped make those dreams come true. He and I shared a love for a particular poem by one John Gillespie Jr., High Flight, that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. And when I think of it, I will look up and I'll think of Poppy. It's for you, Poppy. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I have climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you've not dreamed of. I've wheeled and swung and soared, high in the sunlit silence, hovering there. I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue. I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod, the high, untrespassed sanctity of space reached out my hand and touched the face of God. I love you, Poppy. Hello, everyone. My name is Travis Streets, and Malcolm Gillis was my grandfather. But to his grandchildren, he will always be our Poppy. President Gillis paved the way for the countless fruition of dreams, as many here can and have attested. And much will be said about his larger-than-life greatness and his many achievements publicly and privately. But I'm here today to say a few words about the greatness of Poppy. Poppy was a man full of strength and compassion who inspired all of us to reach for the stars. With a wide-brimmed hat and a six-shooter at his side, Poppy wandered the woods of his farm in Bahama clearing brush and living his dreams. 
Through the windows, I could see him feed the birds. And I could always remember how he nurtured their lives and how he loved them. He would spirit us away in his steel-bottomed truck, rocking and rolling off-road into my blue suede shoes. And he showed us the land that he loved, and he made sure that we loved it too. And in the evening, when he settled down to watch the Duke wrangle the Wild West, or the Blue Devils wrangle the competition, he made us laugh and passed on his passion to us. He challenged us to think and to back up our beliefs with facts and a burning but even temper. He taught us to have convictions and to seek knowledge for the value of the incredible journey of knowing. Today, I will leave you with the last thought he left me with before he went wandering. Don't let anything stand in your way. His words struck me to the core and I will always carry them in my heart of hearts. Because the true greatness of Poppy was the flood of love with which he nourished the hearts of his family and the world. He answered his call with bravery and strength, and he will be missed eternally. My name is Elizabeth, and I am now the middle grandchild as of a few months ago. Um, when I think about Poppy, I remember when I was a little girl living on the farm in Bahama, and he would lovingly pat me on the shoulder and say, hello, goober. And I did not know that goober meant peanut or lovable goofball, and I did not like this. And so after several of these greetings, I exclaimed, I'm not a goober, Poppy. Uh, it's taken me several more years to know that it is a very special thing um, to have known Poppy well enough to be a goober and to be so close to him. Um, the poem that I'm going to read is a little bit more serious. Uh, we all know that Poppy loved this school, as we've been reminded today, and that he loved owls. Um, the poem I'll be reading is by Mary Oliver, and it's called White Owl Flies Into and Out of the Field. Coming down out of the freezing sky with its depths of light, like an angel or a Buddha with wings, it was beautiful and accurate, striking the snow and whatever was there with a force that left the imprint of the tips of its wings five feet apart, and the grabbing thrust of its feet and the indentation of what had been running through the white valleys of the snow. And then it rose gracefully and flew back to the frozen marshes to lurk there like a little lighthouse in the blue shadows. So I thought, maybe death isn't darkness after all, but so much light wrapping itself around us, as soft as feathers, that we are instantly weary of looking and looking and shut our eyes, not without amazement, and let ourselves be carried as through the translucence of mica to the river that is without the least apple or shadow, that is nothing but light, scalding aortal light in which we are washed and washed out of our bones. We love you, Poppy. Hi, um, I'm Caroline Bynum, and I used to be the youngest grandchild, but not anymore. Um, so I'm just gonna read a little something that I wrote. <clears throat> You held me in your strong, broad arms, a hulking giant you seemed, until you kissed my red forehead, and in your eyes there gleamed. A single tear wiped away the product of your love. I knew you then, I know you now, a man held high above. Your soft white beard, your feet up high, your expertly freckled skin. You'd grasp my hand, hold it tight, and softly kiss my chin. For all there was, and all there is, we never had to think what life would mean without you here, our chain, our rock, our link. We loved you then, we love you now, a man, a mystery, for all the things you ever were and all you wished to be. A garbage man, a teacher, a husband, a father too, your boundless love within them and theirs within you. So as the days seem shorter and the nights approach so slow, you asked me what I loved, and I told you what I know. I love the life you gave me and all that makes it deep. You held my hand once more and told me not to weep. You smiled with remembrance as God above you stood. One final sigh, your parting breath. Darling, you be good. Thank you.
<clears throat> Elizabeth has asked me to read some excerpts from some of the many <clears throat> emails and letters that uh, she's received. You'll see a, um, a theme that runs through here that's very consistent with all the heartfelt remarks we've heard today. The first ones are from family and longtime friends. <clears throat> Malcolm was a much admired person for his many accomplishments, but I'll always respect him more for all the anonymous good deeds that he did for the little man. Thanks for introducing me to Alaska, float fishing and exposure to wide variety of interesting people. I relive the trips, thumbing through the numerous photo albums. Thank you. You were the great brother and friend. I have so many fond memories of Malcolm. I will always remember his generosity, his patience, and his capacity for hard work. He truly was a great man, and I consider myself fortunate to have known him. <clears throat> My memories include, of course, stories about how much the Indonesians trusted him, going to Red Sox games, dinner parties in Lexington, and Mike putting him in the back seat of his VW Beetle for the extra traction coming up Belmont Hill in the snow. Another Malcolm, there will never be. <clears throat> when the curtain has closed, to me, Malcolm defined friendship. Malcolm delivered. The next group are <clears throat> from uh, colleagues and uh, from Harvard and Duke. <clears throat> I can see his vibrant energy in front of me, whether making a joke in his office at Duke, riding a lawnmower, at your home north of Durham, or joining us at a birthday party. I can't think of anyone who had a bigger impact on my choice of career than Malcolm. A seminar by him that I attended basically by chance when I was fresh out of college made me see economics in a new way, and his writings stoked my interest. Malcolm was such a vital, robust bundle of energy and vibrant intelligence who brightened all of our lives as he made our work more productive and our purposes better, all the while sharing his great sense of humor and sharp wit. We will miss him dearly. And the following are from Rice. He was an outstanding man, a leader, an educator, an intellectual, and a mentor, all with a tremendous and mischievous sense of humor. His legacy lives on in thousands of students that had the chance to know him and learn from him over the years. I include myself among those blessed students. Malcolm, you let your passion for, ri for rice and for life show so clearly in every venue, and you are always prepared and knowledgeable about whatever issue is on the table. It was wonderful to see Malcolm in action as Rice's president and to be by his side on several important issues, and most importantly, to become his friend. Dr. Gillis was the most inspiring teacher I had while at Rice. In the short time I knew him, he changed for the better both me and the person that I hoped to become. The next group are from friends at other universities outside of the United States, a friend from Bremen. It makes me so sad to know we will never see him again here at Jacobs. It is an incredible loss for all of us. Without him and his vision of higher education, I would never have had experienced such an inspiring time like we had in the late 90s when we founded IUB. And from Maya Dang, president of Tantau University, Vietnam, Almost 10 years since the first time I met Dr. Gillis, surrounded by books, documents in his room at Rice University. During the ringing of his phone nonstop, we exchanged opinions about the first US-style university in Vietnam. Malcolm has brought us together and made my dream come true. TTU has been established and growing. And from James Ken, president and co-founder of Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. 
I had the privilege and pleasure of working alongside Malcolm as we shared a vision of establishing a university in one of the most destitute places on earth. Thanks to his friendship, faith, commitment, and love, that vision was realized five years ago. My friend, Dr. Malcolm Gillis, will be missed, and his contributions to our university and the people of North Korea will serve as an inspiration to all. And finally, I want to mention an award that Malcolm received uh, actually while he was in MD Anderson, um, and it's uh, a special award from the Rice Alumni Association. Um, let me read from a letter uh, nominating Malcolm for this award. Malcolm authored informative and candid letters to the alumni each year. I recall spirited discussions with Malcolm and other vice presidents on content of the letters, but in the end, the letters were always Malcolm's unique voice speaking to the community on campus activity and plans. I consider Malcolm Gillis a role model, a mentor, and a friend, and I wholeheartedly support Malcolm being named an honorary Rice alumnus. There have only been 10 other people uh, in the history of Rice that have received this award, and my wife Haroldine and I were fortunate to be able to present it to him at the hospital and hold his hand and, and tell him uh, how much we loved him uh, and, and uh, he was able to acknowledge and it, it meant a lot to him. Of all the people speaking today, I've known Malcolm for the shortest time. But it's amazing how when you hear all these different perspectives, the essential qualities of a man emerges. I'm a little reminded on this occasion of a faculty meeting I once attended where one person said, there's no way to avoid repeating what's already been said, to which another person responded, oh yes, there is. <laughs> Nonetheless, I met Malcolm the day my appointment as his successor was announced. Ping and I visited Malcolm and Elizabeth in the president's home, then O'Connor House. And before I knew what was happening, I suddenly had a new tie one with owls on it. But it wasn't really a new tie, it was Malcolm's tie. What I learned later was that Malcolm didn't simply give people owl ties as gifts. If someone admired his tie, he would often take it off immediately and give it to him. That generosity typified Malcolm. He lived with an exuberance and generosity that was hard to resist. He lives so forcefully in our memories that it is indeed hard to believe that he's not here with us. Of the many things that I admired about Malcolm, I particularly admired just how far he had come from his origins, and yet he didn't forget them. As you have heard, Malcolm began his higher education at what was then Chipola Junior College in Mariana, Florida. Malcolm went there because it was within walking distance of his grandmother's house, and he could continue living at home and working two jobs, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Think about that, starting in a junior college while working two jobs and ending up at Harvard, Duke, and Rice. And as president of a university that is a member of the most elite group of universities, it is a kind of intellectual Horatio Alger story. Or to put it a different way, Governor Ann Richards once said of someone, and we'll pretend that we don't remember who, that they were born on third base and thought they hit a triple. Malcolm wasn't even born inside the ballpark. And yet he hit a grand slam not measured merely by his own achievements, but by what he brought to others. And that's a second thing that I admired in Malcolm, and it really has been the theme of our remarks today, his desire to help others. I was a beneficiary of that. That desire was reflected both in how he engaged with individuals and how he engaged with the world. Malcolm never forgot his roots. He was never anything close to a snob. His deeds and actions reflected his deep belief that everybody deserves a chance. Whether it was mentoring a budding scholar 
as he did with our provost, Mari Lynn Miranda, or producing scholarship and advising governments to impact the lives of millions, or if you have heard, producing scholarship and advising governments, or helping establish universities in Vietnam and North Korea, the common thread through everything Malcolm did was helping others. When Malcolm returned to the faculty following his presidency, he brought his extraordinary talent and passion as a teacher and mentor. And that is why, with the encouragement of the economics department and his family, contributions received in memory of Malcolm will be used to establish the Malcolm Gillis Award for Distinction in Undergraduate Teaching in Economics. Shortly after arriving at Rice, I learned of Malcolm's plans to having a boxing match, match with George Foreman. <laughs> Malcolm, I think, was quite serious about this, but in a playful sort of way. But for me, it was a metaphor, a metaphor about Malcolm's willingness to take Rice toe-to-toe -to -toe with the very best, to challenge us to new levels of aspiration, if Malcolm was going to challenge George Foreman, Rice was going to challenge the best universities of the world. Malcolm was above all a positive person, an optimist about what could be achieved, and that optimism infected this entire university. Malcolm's influence on Rice was multifarious and long-lasting. Everywhere you look across this campus, you see evidence of his contributions. He launched, as you have heard, the first comprehensive capital campaign for Rice. He developed the nano, bio, and viro themes that helped define our intellectual ambitions as a university. He built a new building for the humanities that shouted Rice's commitment as a broad-gauged university. He fostered a strong engagement with the Texas Medical Center, and he made clear his commitment to diversity and opportunity for all. Malcolm's passion for this university was evident in everything from athletics to music to physics. No one ever had a doubt about where Malcolm's priorities were. They were passionately, invariably, whatever contributed to the success of Rice. Malcolm's lack of snobbishness and wide-ranging interest in human affairs, which you've heard so much about today, were reflected in the commencement speech he gave seven years ago at his alma mater, now Chipola College. He spoke about the future with optimism and a sense of responsibility. He interwove technologies from the popular TV show and movie Star Trek into his talk and concluded with the famous Vulcan invocation live long and prosper. Malcolm didn't stay with us long enough, but he sure caused a lot of people to prosper at Duke and Rice and countless people around our planet. I want to thank Richard White and Joel Fleischman for taking the time to help us celebrate the Duke part of Malcolm's life. I'd like to thank Bob Yekovich and the extraordinary people from the Shepherd School for bringing such beauty to today's ceremony. And most of all, I'd like to thank Elizabeth and Malcolm's entire family, not just for what you've contributed to us today, but what you as a family, and that's one of the first things that struck me on meeting Malcolm, that leading this university was very much for Malcolm a family affair, so we thank you for that. In a moment, we'll have a final musical number, a favorite of Malcolm's and Elizabeth's, followed by a recessional reflecting both Malcolm's heritage and style. We would ask you to remain in your places until the family has had a chance to reach the foyer, where we welcome you to further celebration with the family of the life and contributions of Malcolm Gillis. Mm -hmm. 